in a world where there are demon demigorgon dogs, children with gifts, and a really weird guy that's obsessed with shooting nerds. Strange things happen. Or should I say, stranger things happen. Did we make that joke in like one of the past podcasts? <laughs> Didn't we do that already? That's be that's a good segue into what we're gonna talk about. This is a, a the podcast about season four Stranger Things. If you guys haven't watched it, go watch it because we're gonna have all sorts of fucking spoilers. Once again, oh, I'm yeah. Wildfire One, and with me as always is my heterosexual life mate. Grizzly McBee, what's up, y'all? Oh man, and we got a lot to talk about. Like season four of Stranger Things was a mind fuck, and it came in two parts. The first part was great, and the second part was just a great Even ending. Better. Yeah, it just it just added more to it. And I'm gonna say this season was the season of taking old songs and making them great again. Oh, yeah. I'm going to start off with that. Uh, Jesus Christ. Okay. Well, let's begin at the beginning. Uh, last season, season three, Ella had lost her powers. Um, fucking Hopper was supposedly dead, but he wasn't dead. We had, we had already called that he was probably in, in Russia. Uh, Russia, which it turns out that's where he was at. Thanks for the... Uh, in in credits bonus content for that yeah but and and the funny thing is 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 we called that before either one of us even saw the end credits mm -hmm. and it turned out i mean honestly the way it went was good Uh, this was also i mean i've 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 seen some stuff off tiktok and some stuff off social media where people were complaining that certain things happened, but we'll get to that when we get to it. Um, this season more or less started out with L was with like what? Will. Will's family. Yeah, uh, Will and his mom and his brother Jonathan. Yeah, so she's because Hopper was dead. I'm using air quotes. Dead. He was dead, supposedly, and really in in Russia like we called but in the gulag <laughs> yeah in the gulag like one of the worst gulags ever so she's li- you know Elle's living with them it's been I don't know how many how long has it been um well it's into the next school year uh eight months after uh season three yeah so it's it in 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 Stranger Things land it's it's 1986 yeah I've seen a few memes online where they're like, "Oh, well, some of the stuff, all the, some of the stuff that you see in the background in the scenes isn't uh, isn't proper to the time." These, it seems like people just want to nitpick shit. Or someone was complaining that there were exter- external um, AC units, you know, the little boxes outside of buildings. Uh, and I guess that wasn't a thing then. I can't tell you. I, I lived then. I just didn't pay attention. Uh, well, people can go back to watching My Little Pony and fuck right off. Yeah, exactly. Like, stop nitpicking. The series is good. It's good. <laughs> Season four continues with the D&D references. In fact, yep. the first episode of season four, we meet Eddie, who's fucking amazing, who's like their new GM in high school. He's like the one nerd everyone loves to meet. He is. He was a... Uh... Like a super duper senior. <laughs> yeah, this this was his year. He was supposed to graduate. He supposedly was held yep. back a few years. And um, really cool guy. Like, you know, the exact what you'd expect of a cool guy in the eighties. Long hair, loved metal, loves loves music, loves really like loves is a musician himself, but kind of kind of a part of that like losers club, you know, because mm. he's a nerd. And this is, I'm, and I'm glad they put this in. The first, this first part of Stranger Things really dug deep and talked about like how D and D was a, a cult, how people started yeah. calling D D and D players a cult, and how uh, and how they were like 
worshipping the devil because we they played games they we play games that have to do with like magic and using your imagination and stuff and like that. Satan yes. And all that shit. Yeah. In, in in real in reality, it was just and it, unfortunately I hate to say this but that was in the 80s that was a thing. They did that was literally a thing. There was people on television mm-hmm. trying to blame uh D&D for fucking bad shit happening. Now whether that besides suicide. Yeah. Shooting. Exactly. You know, um, now whether that there's a correlation to that, I can't tell you. I don't think I, I've played D and I didn't go out and fucking summon Satan. So. So I was born in 1986, and I've been playing D and D since I was 12. Mm-hmm. Was 98. So, I mean, I've never summoned Satan. I've never killed anyone. Well, the Hellfire and Club Fire is a great. Level. Is a great, and that's their their D and D club in high school, the Hellfire. The Hellfire club. It's a great reference and throwback to the problems of that as well. And I mean, mm-hmm. it was the eighties was a different time. Uh, without getting too political, like homosexuality was looked down upon. Anything different from society was seen a certain way, and of course, normal was a whole different concept back in the eighties. Nerds that played D and D were looked down upon and were were judged. Almost kind of like in in the show with that football player going ape shit. But we'll get to that story later on. Um, huh? Basketball player. What was it bas? Sorry, basketball player. Well, he's a jock. Typical jock. Yeah. Chrissy, wake up. I, I had a friend show me that fucking on on TikTok, and now I can't get it out of my head. If you guys haven't seen it, someone did a song with uh, a certain part of Stranger Things for it in the beginning, and it's hilarious. That's all I'll say. What was your first take? Like, let's talk about the D and D references because it it's been D and D references since the first season. What was your first take on on like the Hellfire Club and like was it Mike and uh, Dustin? Being a Mike part of that. And Justin. Yep. So I like the fact that, you know, they're finally in high school. You know, instead of getting away from their roots, they're just digging deeper into them. Yeah. With the old, these older kids that have, you know, taken them under their wing and, you know, pretty much expanded on how they were playing, you know, because it shows a bit of that. It really had that episode one vibe. Oh yeah, because it because it, it started with D and D, and I think it was uh, Will who was who was GMing in that. Yep. And I, I've seen that meme where they say that Will and and uh, Eddie would be best friends, and I fucking one hundred percent agree. One hundred percent. Those oh, guys, yeah. those guys would oh, get yeah. along, dude, so much. I freaking fell in love with Eddie. You know, episode one of season four. Yeah. It was just, it reminded me of a lot of the guys I hung out with in high school. You know, that over eccentric, got that, that badass vibe to them. Uh, it it kind of gave me that Billy vibe for a second. Yeah, you know what? I thought that too with the long hair. And because they first introduced him, he seemed kind of like a prick at first. Uh, yeah. But you kind of fall in love with him because, I mean, who doesn't who doesn't want the whole the whole issue and the whole reason he's kind of being a prick is because Lucas was trying to be one of the cool kids and was and didn't want to you know was either go to his like, championship championship game. game or go to the Hellfire Club finale and of a of campaign. a campaign, and yeah. Lucas chose that and they were trying to find someone to replace him and they end up getting Lucas's sister who we've already fallen in love with like in the last season. Oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, Erica freaking hilarious. Yeah. So there's a there's actually like a really cool compilation between the two where where you see Lucas playing and then they're they're playing D&D and they're like rolling the dice and it's like a life or death situation either they get a 20, a nat 20 or they fucking lose and it's a situation to where but Lucas is throwing the ball and it's one of those like make or break situations and they just put the two side by side it's just fucking it's just it's almost mm-hmm. the same thing yeah 
the way they built it up and it was just really good and at this point you're you you're already you're already in love with the characters uh eddie was really cool and i understand why he would get mad because who does who wants to like miss out on a cool campaign because one person can't make it we've all had yeah. that problem anyone yeah. that's played D D has had that problem because you put so much time and effort into a campaign because you know most campaigns especially like that one that they had been playing all school year. Oh yeah, you the, put a lot of time and effort into your character, into your experience within the game, into the other players, into the dungeon master, into the NPCs. You know, it's in a way for those of you that have never actually played D and D, you make your character. And then, in a sense, well, you become that character. Oh, yeah. That's that a, that player that you created for the campaign. The more you play it, the more you put into it, and the more the player grows, almost, uh, the character grows, and you grow into that character. And I think it needs to be said that the villain in the D&D campaign's name was Vecna, because that's going to come back. Those of you who watched it know where we're going. Those of you who didn't, you probably want to skip this podcast altogether because it's going to be chock full of theories and shit that happened in the season. Like, we can't talk about this without going through it because, to be honest with you, this is our therapy. This has to be our oh, therapy. Yeah. We need oh, it. Yeah. You're going to need it. And I say that because every D&D or every, every bad guy in Stranger Things so far has matched the D&D villain that they've had to deal with. And in this yep. case, it's going to be Vecna. Uh, that's the nickname they give who this new guy we learn about. We could tell that Max is having some issues. She's constantly yeah. listening to that one song. The song from Kate Bush, the Deal With God. Or, Running Up That Hill. Huh? Running Up That Hill. Running Up That of- Hill, yeah. Well, it, But it that's that song actually became like popular again like a lot of and honestly it has every has every right in the world to become popular because it's a good song and it's nice to damn good exactly and it's nice to see a song from the 80s kind of go full circle into being back in the spotlight well that was max's favorite song she was listening to that she was obviously depressed uh there was another gal named chrissy (laughs) who was very depressed and they were all going to see the same uh, like school psychiatrist kind of thing Chrissy started going out of her way to try and find a uh, drug dealer, and this is where Eddie comes in, right? Well, this, this, okay, so... Yeah, con- uh, continue. The reference continue. on that is she started seeing things, having real bad terrors. A clock. Not, not just in her sleep. The, she started seeing a grandfather clock that would only chime four times. But, and this and, is... I, I'm going to add to this real quick. I don't know if you noticed this, but that grandfather clock, at least the sound, started in season one. It did. We've heard it, it every did. time something was going on. She was getting to the point to where any time she even closed her eyes, she was seeing this horror. And she went to... Eddie is also a, a big pothead and cokehead and all that. There was a place just off the school property up in the woods that, uh, you know, the Hellfire Club would meet at. So during school, she went up there, found Eddie, and said that she needed something to help calm her nerves. Mm -hmm. He kind of, he was, when he was talking to her in the woods before, and when she was, a little after she had that hallucination, saw the clock in the fucking tree, he kind of, I want to say he like, was very, very charismatic. Like, when he was talking to her, you could tell, like, she wasn't feeling it, and he's like, you don't have to do this, but then he started, like, being fun and 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 making the drug deal fun. If fate didn't turn out the way it did for her, I think that those two would have made a good couple. So they end up getting in his van, you know, because everybody had a panel van back then. Oh, of course. Going to his trailer. Mm-hmm. And by then, you know, the, the sun's starting to go down and everything. And Max, who lived right across the street, saw her and him going into the trailer. You know, she gets this, like, puzzled look on her face because, you know, it's the captain of the cheer squad. Yeah, she's the preppy yeah. good girl who's never done anything wrong. And she's with Eddie, who's kind yeah. of... Yeah. 
kind of a bad boy losers club kind of thing. And the fact that she was dating the captain of the basketball team. Yeah. Real douchebag. They go into the trailer and, you know, she starts kind of zoning out. And he's like, you know, you, you don't have to do this if you don't want to. You know, trying not to pressure her into it, trying yeah, to give her know. that out. She's like, no, I, I need this. You get to so see little goes, snippets of, like, her fear, too. I don't know if you remember. Like, you've seen, you seen like, like her mom was her biggest fear, it seemed, in this yeah. one. Uh, because because I guess she was just trying to like impress her and she didn't feel like she could ever meet her standards or whatnot. And in this case, the bad guy was using that fear uh, against her, as we find out later on. So he goes into into his room and goes to get into his stash. As he comes back out into the living room where he left her, he's looking around and, you know, can't really see her and then realizes she's you know, like a foot below the ceiling, just kind of dangling there. Most, I don't know about you, but I cringed so oh, much, man, me too. Me so too. much during that shit. Every time it happened, it happened at least four times, three, three or four times in this this, this season. Four times. He starts freaking out. Chrissy, well, wake up! Maybe. I don't like this. Yeah, <laughs> you know. Next thing you know, she goes ghost white, bloodshot. Eyes disappear. Eyes back in their head, yeah. And then her body just starts to contort, you know, ways that aren't supposed to be happening. You Bones know, you can hear breaking. Breaking. he starts losing his shit. Because because it kind of fades to black at one point. We don't see what happens until the mm-hmm. next day. And then he and Eddie's missing. Um I think at this point we need to talk about L. What's going on with L? You know, it it takes that scene, you know, back from season one where, you know, she's got the blood running down, you know, blood all over her gown. And she turns around and Papa goes, what have you done? What have you done? What have you done? And then it cuts to her being, you know, in high school in a class with Will. And and everything looks good. Everything looks like it's going well. At yeah. first, and, to, and then and she and he, it's narrating like a story, not a story, but a, a, a like a, a letter she's sending to Will. Like she's got lots of friends, and, and at first you think that's true, and then you see she's being well, bullied. Well, as you know, it's reading that from her her perspective. It's showing that you know she's being bullied, she's being picked on. You know, the popular girls in school are picking on her, and making fun of her. Which, by the way, fuck that blonde chick. Dead. Yeah. Fuck her and all her friends. Uh, there was and the whole time, Will is, like, sitting there wishing he could fix the situation. Yeah, that he could help her. And doesn't like the fact that she's been lying to Mike. Uh, I get, Apparently, and I guess there's some other shit going on between... Um, oh, Jonathan and yeah. uh, Nancy Wheeler. Jo- Jonathan and Nancy Wheeler, which Nancy can't make her mind up who she fucking wants, and that kind of got on my nerves this season. Oh, that, well, especially in the last two episodes. Yeah. But, the last episode, for sure. But she did turn out to be kind of a badass, but we'll get to that. That was pretty good. Um, and mm-hmm. Jonathan is... like All we see of Jonathan at the beginning of this is he's getting stoned with his new buddy who works at like this pizza place. Argyle. Yeah. Which, by the way, I love that motherfucker. That guy is funny as hell. Surfer uh, Bull surf- Pizza. Yes. Now, I actually saw a thing today on TikTok. Um, the number that's on his van, everybody is saying, call it. You will not be disappointed. What's the number? 805... Four five pizza. Let's call it right now. All right, we're calling this, guys. Okay, I'm making sure. I don't want to call someone fucking at midnight and wake them up. So, eight zero five four five seven four nine nine two. Right? I have no clue. John, Surfer Boy Pizza. This is our guy speaking. We make everything fresh here at Surfer Boy, except for I can't our hear pineapple, it. which comes from a can. Oh, can you hold it? Rachachos, I just got another order before this dude on hold called. It's super specific, like like weird specific. You ready? Okay, so first, it's going to be a six-inch crust, and it's got to <laughs> be super yellow. 
I don't know. Don't ask me, man. That's what they said. It's okay? fucking Argyle. Now, then we got to get the red sauce, okay? Just up to the edge on the crust. So don't go over. The next, they want, and this is really important, four chunks of white mozzarella, three habaneros, nice and bright orange, two green pepper slices. Got to let that habanero sing, man. And then one, just one, piece of blue cheese on top. Now, I know it's strange. Blue cheese is damn near mold, but hey, have you tried it? Try it before you deny, bro. Try okay, it before you deny Okay, that's all I got. It. you get the order? Yeah? It, cool. It, I'm hearing like every okay, other sorry, word. Sorry, bro. Gotcha. Thanks Well... That was a whole shtick. That was that was fucking cool, dude. That was a lot. Be- I was halfway expected some old lady to pick up, going hello. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm like, I'm sorry. And that's Jonathan's best friend in the new this new town, this new city, because they moved to C- California, I believe, right? Yes. Kind of goes to a point. And this is a little later on. Uh, it goes to a point where Elle kind of has to defend herself. Once Mike gets out there, they go to the roller rink the girls that had been bullying her and the guys that had been bullying her they show up and just make her look stupid take her out on the floor and cover her with all kinds of crap and she oh, at just at this point they were trying good. to get her back for narking on her they thought that they got yeah. they narked on her for bullying on her to begin with in school when a teacher just saw what was obviously going on yeah um yeah they poured they poured some like chocolate ice cream or a milkshake on her and basically yeah. embarrassed her in front of her in front of uh, Mike who thought that they were friends which they weren't she was just trying to yeah. go along with it so it would be wouldn't be a lie and then we see I mean there's even one point like and this is probably before that she tried to use her powers on that bitch and she forgot she and, didn't have her powers yep yeah. uh, but yeah she hits the chick at the at the roller rink in the head with a skate gives her like a little concussion or something and then the bitch tries to press charges on her. She gets taken in, uh, and a little skipping a little forward. She gets taken in by the cops the next day, and that's about the time that uh, Will's mom, Will's mom Joyce, she uh, a little before that she got a she got a package from. Um, we're assuming right. Hopper, but it turns out it was from uh, one of the guards at the prison he was at. She finds out he's in a gulag. And that they need money, like what forty grand or something like that. Forty grand to get him out, uh, to pay to get go him to out. Alaska. Yeah, and they gotta they gotta go to Alaska and meet this other Russian dude that's supposed to be like a smuggler. This whole time, while Joyce and Murray are you know heading to Alaska and all that, back in Hawkins, Nancy and Hill. editor of the school paper. Yes, editor of the school paper. They're doing, and he obviously has a crush on Nancy, and he's got this like Harry Potter style fucking scar on his face. It turns out we find out that I guess like he got in an accident and killed someone, and someone died, and he he felt really bad about it. Uh, and we only re- reason we find out is because they're stopping talking to a cop, and he starts hallucinating. The cop's like, "Where well, we know that this happened, and you're a piece of shit," and he and they kind of give us a a backstory of that. And then we realized he was hallucinating if nothing, none of that really happened. Uh, yeah. so they talked herself in to go see where, where she died. And, uh, they were by saying they were going to go check on, uh, Max, Max. Yes. And you know, she, as Nancy's out walking around trying to talk to people, the nerd guy stupidly like walks away and follows whatever sound or what he saw and ends up like getting killed by Vecna. More or less. Like, same shit yeah. happened to him that happened to fucking in Chrissy. The road. In the middle of the road. In the middle of the road. While they're there in the trailer park, Nancy goes and talks to Eddie's uncle, who, you know, swears up and down that this has happened before. It was done by a man by the name of Victor Creel. Now, what happened to Victor Creel is he was blamed for his, the family's, his family's murders. His wife and both of his children. And they were killed in the same way. Then they found out that he was in maximum security psych ward. What happened is they all got together and they are having an argument over who was going to go to this, this place and who was going to finesse their way in. And so 
she got tired of it. I forget what her character's name is. Robin. She got tired of it and she said, "Fuck it, I'm going with I'm going to go with Nancy. You guys can sit." And of course, Steve's pissed off. He's got a babysit yet again. Nancy and Robin ended up going to this mental or uh, this 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 penitentiary mental institution whatever what have you. And they talk to the the guys in charge and basically wow him. Like the way they do it is fucking great. They straight conned him. So they go in and then we get to see Robert England who tells kind of this story of it, it, the way they tell the story is great. He moves into this house with his family. Like, everything's okay, but he, he mentions his son, who is special. And he said that uh, out of nowhere, his wife lifted into the air and shit started breaking. So what, what he was saying, it, was, it wasn't was him that did it. He And he said that... Go ahead. The demons. Yeah, the demons did it. Uh, what had happened was, like, his son was in a coma. His, his, his daughter and wife were dead. He woke up... But he woke up because there was music. He woke up because something brought him back. He said it was a voice of an angel. And about that time, he he turns around while he's telling the story to the girls, and his eyes are completely cut out. He he cut out his own eyes. Yeah, he, he, he basically did to himself. He thought he deserved it. That's all we hear about at Robert England. And at the, about the time the girls have to take off because like the, the guy they conned comes in and realized that they get caught. Yeah, he calls, them, calls their bullshit. Yeah. yeah, calls their bullshit, and they end up having they get away. Um, and I think about that time they found Eddie. They were trying to hide Eddie from the basketball players because the basketball players heard that Eddie was the last one that Chrissy talked to. By this time, they were convinced that the Hellfire Club was a satanic group. Yep. That ritualistically killed her, and they went and found where the other members of the Hellfire Club were and beat the dog crap out of them. And, at le- and they, I mean, Lucas was with them. And about that time, Lucas saw that it was fucked up and he ran. And Lu- Lucas, yeah. uh, everything Lucas wanted was he just didn't want to be a dork. He didn't want to be a nerd. He didn't want to be seen. Well, he wanted to be seen as something else. He wanted to be a jock rather than, rather than be seen as a nerd. Wanted to be popular. Yeah. Robin and Nancy kind of put two and two together after he realized that the reason Victor Creel didn't die was because of his favorite song, the music. Yeah. And, and it was like dream a little dream of me or something like that. Something like that. Yeah. Yeah. He was now, singing and, it all weird. Now, when his wife and his daughter were killed was in the 1950s. So it was 30 years prior. So they get back and they meet up with the rest of the group, realizes the way Vecna is starting to, you know, control somebody to get them out of that spell is to play, you know, that person's favorite song. They were at the cemetery. Because I think this this was definitely after she had her hallucination about with her mom. With her mom and with Billy. Yes. And she felt guilty that she couldn't do anything to help save Billy. Mm-hmm. And that she was kind of glad that he died. And they started they started calling what was going on, like how they died, Vecna's curse. Max kind of goes into this trance while she's at Billy's graveside talking to him. And, you know, everybody's kind of over at the car. They, I, th- I believe they get a call, at least towards the end, about how to, how to get her out of the trance, because yeah. that's what they're worried wait, wait. about. And they get a call yeah. from uh, Nancy and Robin. They look up and see that she's starting to float up in the air. And from what Max could see in her visions, was like this distorted red place in the Upside Down. Oh, he even which... looks at her and goes, why are you here? Like, he was surprised that, that she made it to that area. Because that was like his his safe haven. Yeah. In a sense. And Vecna actually um, looks like kind of like a tentacle creature shit all over him. Really wet looking. Uh, kind of almost kinda, looks like Spawn. Yes. And burnt, kind of burnt up. There's some fucked up shit going on with this guy. And he's creepy. He's very creepy. She sees this broken door that has a rose on it. Like in, in the stained glass. Everything's floating. It's almost like a, a puzzle. It's like taking LSD and like looking at a puzzle book. Fuck yeah. yeah. But then she notices that like near the mantle, these almost like trophy-like things. And one of them is Billy. 
her brother. I didn't notice that part. Yeah. Okay. I noticed the other two dead people from this this season, but I didn't see Billy there. I I maybe I, I just I it slipped me. Maybe I was cooking dinner while I was watching it or something. I don't and know. And that's when she started to you know really freak out. And by this time in the real world, they had started blaring her song. You know, she gets all tied up with these like blood vines. She's freaking out and all everybody seeing on the outside is her, you know, being 15 feet in the air, just kind of eagled out. And she can kind of see it. And like when the music starts, you see like this portal opening. In yeah. That up, world. Up the light. And she can kind of see what, what's going on. She can see herself almost like an out of body experience kind of thing. Yeah. And yeah. at this point, like Vecna's like, there's nothing you can do. There's a, you know, you're, you're mine now, bitch kind of thing. Uh, and the, the music that the, Oh, what's the gals? What's the fucking song? It's Run up that mind. hill. Running, Running up yeah, that hill. It's playing in the background, but it's distorted. And the whole entire time, I'm thinking in my head through this scene. I don't know about you, Grizz. Is I'm like, this could be a really heroic song, or it can be a really sad one. I don't know. This can go both ways. And I'm at that point. I'm expecting. I'm expecting Max to die right then and there, dude. Like, but I'm also thinking, okay, she gets out of this. This is gonna be great. Like, how did you react to that? For me, I, I knew that they weren't going to kill her off right then. Mm-hmm. I knew that well, because, like, the story between her and Lucas it was, what, yeah. wasn't done. Yeah, because at that point, they were kind of not a thing anymore. Uh, yeah. Her, her, pro, her inner issues were in the way. Um, yeah. I know that when she, when, when the moment where she, the, the heroicness happens... She grabs Vecna by like a vine on his neck and just fucking beastly pulls it off. And you can see like it's all nasty and shit. And he drops her, right? Yep. And she starts making a beeline to that portal. And it's almost like slow motion. And rocks and doors and walls and, and then pillars. The whole song, like a, a distorted version of, of that. The whole time, the distorted version of that song is playing almost like you're listening to it underwater. Mm -hmm. And she's running and running, and it's almost like in slow motion, and he's, like, healing, and he's okay, and he's coming at her. And you're thinking, fuck, he's going to catch her ass. And then it just goes to black. As she gets to the light. You see her wake she up. all falls out of the sky. Yep. <laughs> Which, let, like, honestly, Mo, here we go. Golf clap, best part of that, of the part one of season four. Best part right there of part one. That right there, like, I've never been into... It's, I've been, it's been a long time since I was that far into a character where I'm like, oh, they better not kill that bitch. They better not kill that bitch. No, 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 no. I, I was, like, heart and soul into that moment. With the song playing, like, they chose the perfect song for the perfect scene, and it was just perfect. Like, what were, what were your thoughts about that? That, that was actually uh, episode four. Ah. When all that happened. You know, I, I was like, okay, they they found a way to get out of that trance, but it can't last forever. And, you know, she, she had mentions to them the one thing that she sees every time she had one of those visions was that grandfather clock. Yeah. Like, they put two, in, they put two and two together and figured out, because I guess the house that uh, Robert England's character Creel lived in, had that door so what we saw in that warped version of vecna's mind was like a fucked up version of that house yeah so in episode three while um l is at the police station he ends up taking her to an abandoned icbm silo in nevada yeah it also should Which be mentioned that the the government is also trying to get a hold of l to kill trying her. to get a hold of a uh, U.S. Army Lieutenant Colonel Jack Sullivan mm -hmm. because he believes that she is the one that has been doing all the killings, cool, yeah. doing these brutal killings. And they get to the silo, and as soon as they walk in, who is there to greet them mm -hmm. but Papa himself? And that's and, that's a red light for her already because she can't, she doesn't feel like she can trust him for good reason. So she starts to freak out, tries to leave while not having any powers, being a 13-year-old girl. These MPs that work there, they easily grab her and drug her. And next thing you know, she's in a room like she used to be in, wearing the same shit she used to when she was, you know, a younger girl. Comes out and, 
you know, kind of has a, a sit down with Papa. They explained to her that they can bring back her superpower and that they, they can bring it back, but it's going to be a long, hard process. And during the time while they're doing that, like, Papa's like, turn it up higher, do do this higher. And she's, she's in this, like, device. I forget, it's, it's called, like, Nina or something like that. It, it is called Nina. Well, then the other, yeah, the other doctor, I don't, I can't remember his name. During this, during this scene where, like, they have her in this Nina device, she starts seeing, like, her past, and we, we learn about some of the other, the other uh, patients that were there with her that had powers and stuff. And one of the things she kept asking some of the others and some of the others, that, like some of the other uh, kids, and she was also bullied. She didn't really have many uh, powers that manifested when she was first there. In fact, there's a, there's a scene where she's up against another guy. I forget what his number was, but she, like... He, he started, like, they bullied her, and she just, like, kicked his ass because of whatever emotion brought out, right? There's this guy that works there. He's like a... I, I orderly. Got, he's like an orderly. Thank you. He's like an orderly, and he's talking to her, and he's like, look, you, you're special. It's okay. We come to find out that everyone's asking about number one. And nobody's saying anything. And no one's saying, and no one knows. Even even this order is like yeah I I've met number one I know yeah, I've knew I knew him and yada yada come to find out he was number one he was number one more come to find out we're gonna fast forward a little bit it wasn't her that killed everyone it was number one yeah, yeah. he what well, what happened uh, I say I fast forward a little bit what happened was he kind of number one kind of had like an inhibitor chip in his head or neck or something you yeah in his in his neck yeah in his I, neck. I think it was like yeah, like in the back of his neck or and something. And he had he had Eleven take it out with her powers because she was actually powerful enough to do so. Um, once she did that, there was nothing holding him back. He literally decided everyone here needs to die. He killed all of the special kids except for Eleven. And what we saw in that first scene in, or in that first season was her getting rid of one. She had she had. Uh, pushed one against the wall and it accidentally opened up a portal to the upside down to where it pushed him through which warped his body and like literally burnt got really fucked up honestly any other human being going through there would have been dead come to find out number one is vecna yes Number one is vecta and his name is henry his name is henry that was the that was literally the end to the first part of four. And then we had to wait till November, or November, uh, July 1st to watch the rest of it. Did you just say November? <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> July 1st, it comes out. I watch it. He watched it before I did. He goes, have you seen it yet? Because we, we're talking about doing a podcast on it. The last, the last part of, of, of that season four was insane and beautiful and great and everything made sense and that's why we love Stranger Things. Cause it, it, it goes into your nerdy mind, your GM mind, your 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 love of Dungeons and Dragons and makes everything make sense. Season and the best part about it in my opinion is there's certain things I can't go I saw that coming. Before we get into this uh volume two of, of season four. Yes. With the last last two episodes. Um so what happens with Joyce and Murray, they meet this guy named Yuri in Alaska who is supposed to get take the money and then fly to Russia, get Hopper out, bring him back. Well, instead, uh, Yuri ends up drugging Joyce and Murray and just taking them to Russia. The way it turns out is once they get to Russia... He ends up turning on the guy that was helping Hopper, like calls the warden and is like, hey, so this is what's going on. I've got these two. Uh, you might want to take care of him. So then basically turns on the guy, well, the, the, the whole plan, the corrections officer, the corrections officer guy working there um, ends up getting thrown in the cell with Hopper mm -hmm. and it kind of turns out that that cell block that they're in is been kind of like selected for 
pretty much the 80s version of the Roman Colosseum against a Demogorgon. They get taken in, you know, given this nice big meal. Everybody's all laughing Which, and all this. Let's and talk about food. that. Let's talk about that meal for a second. The meal, they thought, like, oh, they're feeding us to get us strong so we can have we can have a chance to test our might against this thing. Hopper knew all along, because Hopper had dealt with these things before. Hopper tells them, no, they're fattening us up so we could feed it. Yep. And, uh, the, and the whole room, like, they're all laughing and drinking and having a good time and enjoying the best meal they've had in a long time. The whole room gets quiet. It's, they're just all depressed instantly. So he comes up with this elaborate plan for them to stick together to be able to kill this thing. As soon as they get into the arena, well, it goes horribly. Big surprise. Guys start, guys start freaking out. and There's only like three of them that end up surviving. Uh, mm-hmm. Like the end, I don't know what, like 10, 12 guys. The prison guard, Ant- Antonov, gets thrown in with Hopper. All that stuff happens. Well, then we jump over to Joyce. And, you know, Joyce and Murray ended up getting drugged, put on a plane, and they're flying to to Russia so that Yuri can turn him in to the warden and get this big reward. And uh, while in flight, uh, Joyce and Murray end up overpowering Yuri and taking control of the plane. Really well, cool scene. Neither one of them know how to fly a plane. <laughs> yeah. So they end up crash landing in the, you know, tundra wilderness of Russia. Then they, you know, come up with this elaborate plan to have Murray impersonate Yuri. Which is also really fucking funny. Yeah. And him take, you know, Yuri and uh, Joyce to the prison to turn them in and you know that gets them into the facility to locate and break Hopper out which they do Yuri Joyce, Murray Hopper and Antonov all escape They, they finally get to a safe place and Antonov uh, makes a phone call to place a call to America. So while um, Eleven is in this secret silo in Nevada, Mike, Will, Jonathan, and Argyle go on this mission to try and save Eleven. They figure the best way to be able to find Eleven is to go to the smartest person they know, which is Dustin's girlfriend, Susie, who is in Salt Lake City. Look around so, and tell me what you see. Yeah. Yes. Throw back to so, season three, buddy. So they drive from California all the way to Salt Lake City and realize that she's got too many fucking siblings. <laughs> so she finally, you know, gets her computer that her dad took from her, figures out where Eleven is, gives him the information. And during that time, the crew back in Hawkins, you know, Nancy, Robin, uh, Dustin, Steve, they find Eddie. And they know that he did not do this, so they're trying to hide him. Mainly from the basketball people. The, let me make this clear. You can see the varsity basketball, the, like the main guy. You can, after after Chrissy died, you can see him slowly deteriorate in his head. Just going. He's going crazy. nuts. I in the way. Eddie. The way I because he because he saw it was him. He the way he sees it, it's him in the Hellfire Club, the the cult, and uh, the way I see it is it's almost like Captain Ahab and Moby Dick. Yes, exactly. He becomes obsessed, like, to the point where, like, at first he's like, I'm just going to teach him a lesson. We're just going to beat him up. And then it just becomes, I'm going to kill this motherfucker. He's going to die. So that's what's going on with him. They're they're hiding him. And at first it's like in a boathouse in some drug dealer's house. 
at some drug dealer's yeah, so place. It, and... They're they're hiding him in this boathouse, and somebody like sees movement in in the house, and ends up telling the basketball team, well, uh, the main basketball guy. I'd, don't even know his name, nor do I care. Yeah, he was a douche. Um, him and one of the other guys, <clears throat> and uh, Lucas, go to investigate. Eddie gets into the boat and starts rowing out into the lake. The basketball players, being jocks, they see him. So they start swimming after him, and they catch him. Um, the main basketball guy, you know, he catches the boat. And the other um, basketball guy that swam out with him um, is, I don't know, 10, 15 yards behind him. And while Eddie and his basketball guy start to fight, they both kind of stop and look over. And the other basketball guy is, you know, 10, 15 feet out of the water, just gets annihilated. He gets vectored. He gets vectored. Yeah. Yeah, he, he gets back that. Um, and he is number three. Yep. So, so far, the count is Chrissy, the nerdy guy that's Nancy's friend, and this basketball guy. The, bas- the, the main basketball guy, the basketball captain, the team captain, still swears up and down that... It's witchcraft. That Eddie summoned a demon. And that a demon did this. So he starts losing his mind even more. Eddie gets away, um, meets up with the rest of them. They're trying to figure out how Vecna is able to get these people. They wanted to go and investigate the lake. And they get to that spot. They all dive down. Was it Um, Eddie... Uh, Eddie, Nancy, Nancy, Robin, Steve, and Robin. Steve dives down and gets yanked into the upside down. And then Nancy, Robin, and Eddie dive in after. Nancy, Nancy doesn't even think. She just jumps in, and that's where you're like, ah, oh, shit, she's still got feelings for him. Uh, the only one that really doesn't want to go in is Eddie. Eddie's like, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. And he, they, after Robin jumps in, he has no choice, so he joins them too. It's like, well, shit, yeah. So now and, they're all down there. They have to save yeah, Steve. And, we see those demi birds, right? Well, um, Dustin, Lucas, and Erica theorized that Vecna had made gates at each site of the murders. Told them that they would meet them at um, Eddie's trailer. Which, sure, shit, there was a there was a portal there. Yeah. Which, by the way, those portals so, are fucking cool, man. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Robin and Eddie ed- go through the, the portal safely. But as uh, Steve and Nancy are talking, Steve's trying to oh, say, yeah. you know, okay, you go you go next. Nancy you know, kind of gets gets possessed by Vecna, and she that's when she discovers that he, his name was Henry. He was Victor Creel's son. Yep. Um, that's where all that's revealed to us. Yeah, and that's in episode seven. And that's where that ends. And, it, it it literally ends right where we get the truth. Where where we find out number one is it's Vecna, Henry. Is Henry is Henry. yeah, and and he explains all of that to to Nancy. He kind of takes her into the facility where Eleven, where he was. She gets the and shows. Yep. Yeah, he shows, shows her, her that stuff. Everything that happened and how he, you know, befriended Eleven, and, uh, it, and then it kind of cuts to Eleven, and she remembers that he was the one that killed everybody in the lab. Yep, and that's about the end of that of part one. Like that's and, and that, that, literally that where it ends. Exact, it, it, that is the exact end of volume. It leaves yeah. you. It leaves you wanting like more. You, you're like, God, this can't be it. This can't be it. But turns out it was it. In a world where Henry is number one, and number one is Vecta, and Vecta is Henry, and Henry went to the upside down 
because he pissed off Eleven and killed all of her friends. Now we're in the same spot. What's going to happen in Volume 2? Stay tuned to the next episode. Yeah, just like that. We got to you got to fucking wait just like we did. Ha! <laughs>